after a buildup like that, <laughs> it uh, can be nerve-wracking. I was going to have you all stand with me to read the Word, and I was going to go on about preachers reading long passages, but bear with me. If you felt tired, you could sit down. And uh, then I was going to read John 11.35. Some of you may be familiar with that. Go ahead, put it up. Jesus wept. And then let you sit down. That's what I was aiming for. You're allowed to chuckle. You can laugh in church. It's okay. In fact, we were talking this morning about laughter being a cure for things. Jesus wept. (laughs) Oh, goodness. You find that in John chapter 11 and verse 35. It's the shortest scripture in the English Bible. Not all versions. You'll find some versions where they add a word or two. Still among the shortest. But what is in John chapter 11? Why is Jesus crying? If you read that passage of Scripture, you find out that Jesus had a friend by the name of Lazarus. And in John chapter 11, Lazarus becomes sick. And he's got two faithful sisters that live with him, Mary and Martha. Now, these are intelligent women. They grasp the fact our brother is sick. Jesus heals people. Let's go get Jesus. And so they send a message some miles north, and they say, they, you know what? This is how close Jesus' relationship is with Lazarus. They don't come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. They come up to Jesus and they say, Lord, the man you love is sick. Lazarus and Jesus are friends. They know each other. People are aware of how much they care about each other so much that they can they can say that and Jesus immediately knows who they're talking about. And I'm sure that the messengers that they sent expected Jesus to pack his bags that moment and strike out for Bethany, which is where Lazarus lived. But the Bible says that Jesus did absolutely nothing. It wouldn't surprise me if the messenger repeated the message once or twice. Are you not getting it, Master? The man you love is sick. Don't don't you understand? It's not a cold. It's not a sore throat. He's going to die if you don't come. And Jesus does not go. In fact, the Bible says that he waited at least two or three days. And then he wakes his men up. He says, and we're going to see Lazarus. Now, he had some bright boys in his crew, okay? They said, Jesus, the last time you were down by Bethany, they tried to kill you. We figured that's why you were staying away. You were afraid for your life. And he said, no. They said, well, why do you want to go? And he said, my friend, Lazarus is sleeping, and I go to wake him up. Now, again, being the bright gentleman that they are, they said, he's sleeping. No big deal. He can let him wake up on his own time. And so Jesus spelled it out. Lazarus is dead, and I'm going to see him. And his disciples, being the brave men that they were, said, let's go and die with him. They had such confidence in in the future. (laughs) And he went and he traveled toward Bethany. Now, this is hard for us to understand. Okay, When we have a funeral... We may sing a couple songs. There may be some tears shed. We'll share some stories. But funerals were very different in that day and age. You you look, it, it, it briefly mentions it in Scripture. But you know what they would do? They would hire people to come and mourn at the funeral. In fact... The more you were loved and the more wealth your family had, the more mourners that you had. And when I'm talking about mourners, we're not talking about people coming to shed tears. This is the weeping and the wailing that you may have heard sometimes when you 
hear tapes from Middle Eastern countries, they're making a big deal. These are, these are men and women who are paid. That, that's their job is to go around and weep and wail at funerals. That's what they do. They're professionals at it. Maybe they carry onions in their pockets. I don't know. But they're making a fuss. And somebody comes into that funeral and says, Jesus is here. Mary and Martha, both alone, they go to him. And they both say the same thing. If you had come, he would not have died. <laughs> We're very sanitized. You know, we imagine that they folded their hands. If only you had been here. I very much doubt that that's how it went down. I think there were probably some tears shed. And I'm probably pretty certain there may have been a tinge of anger in both of their voices. What were you thinking? If you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. And that's when in the scripture it says two little words it says Jesus wept I looked it up you know again we have that sanitized version of how we think you know a single tear rolls down Jesus no the very next verse says that all the people watching said oh look how Jesus loves him think about that for a minute they're hiring people to weep and to wail to show how much they love him. And Jesus accomplishes that by himself. In other words, this is not a single tear falling down Jesus' face. There's some weeping and wailing going on. There's some grieving taking place. Jesus is impressing professionals with his ability to mourn. And then the thought struck me. Why is he crying? He knows good and well what he's coming to do. He's about to perform the greatest miracle other than his resurrection that he's ever performed. He's about to roll a stone away from a tomb and call a man back from the dead. This is going to be the capstone to his ministry. This is going to be the event that convinces the Jewish leaders, we got to kill this man. Because if we let him go on, he's going to get all the people. He's doing things that nobody's ever done before. This is going to be a moment of triumph. This is going to be a moment of glory. He's going to restore Lazarus to his sisters. And if you think they were mourning, then can you imagine the happiness after? So Jesus, why are you crying? I'm going to give an example. It's a human example, so please forgive me if it doesn't help you to understand. But let me see if it might help you a little bit. I have three boys. The oldest is Bradley. And I don't know if it worked like this for you. But you know, the oldest kid goes to the ER and the doctor a whole lot more <laughs> than the youngest. You know, nowadays, you know, Bradley was in the ER and at the doctor's office quite a bit. Nowadays, you know, I would just look at Aaron and say, look, pick it up, we'll duct tape the arm back on in the morning, it'll be fine. But Bradley, we, we struggled with him being new parents. He, he would get dehydrated. I, I, I'm looking back now wondering why we didn't know how to fix that but apparently we struggled with that problem <laughs> but he had been this he had been to the hospital more than once for this and uh, standard procedure is that they would uh, take him and try to put an IV in his arm this particular time I happened to be with them I was working lots of hours so I was not always with them when they went to the ER and 
They brought him in that little room. They said he's dehydrated. I'm going to put an IV in him. And uh, Trisha basically told me, you know, I've gone through enough of these. It's your turn. And she left, which upset me a little bit because I wanted to leave. And now I had to stay. I wasn't fair. Well, actually, it was fair. Okay. <laughs> And I remember what they did. They, they got two or three nurses in there. Looking back, it's kind of funny because he's, you know, he's three or four years old. It wasn't like he was going to go ballistic and hurt people. But they brought two or three nurses in there. And uh, they said, we need you to hold him down. And they brought in that IV that is full of life-giving fluid that's going to make that discomfort and that pain go away. That thing that's going to heal him, they brought it in and they poked it in his arm. He looked up at me with his big blue eyes. And big fat tears started rolling down his face. And I remember it very clearly. I, he didn't put it in words, but, you know, the look was, how could you let them do this to me? You've betrayed me. You let them hurt me. And he looked up at me and he was crying. And he said, she bit me. <laughs> then they did it a second time and he said she bit me again why aren't you doing anything dad and I you know maybe this offends your sense of manhood and if it does I'm sorry but you know by this time I was crying and laughing at the same time <laughs> which I'm sure he didn't understand but it was pretty funny why is Jesus crying he knows that healing's coming. He knows triumph's coming. He knows he's about to do something in our lives that nobody else can do. Why is he crying? Because in that moment, their grief touched him. They felt like he had left them alone. Like he had let their brother die. And he knew that that wasn't the case. But he saw the grief and the pain, and it moved him to tears. They were not alone. They thought they were. But here's Jesus, a Jesus moved by tears. This should not surprise us. Because if you look at Isaiah chapter 53, it says the Messiah is acquainted with grief and a man of sorrows. This is going to be somebody that knows what it's like to hurt. People go, what does God have to have? What, what does he have to, to feel grief about? He's God. Huh. God knows more about grief than you and I ever will. See, go all the way back to the beginning. And he made a perfect world, Aaron. He crafted it. He put it in place. He made it beautiful. And when it's done, he said, it's very good. And then he made the crowning creation. He put Adam and Eve. This is, this is, this is everything I've made for you. I'm giving you. I've prepared this for you. It's a special place. Here it is. Now, see, you parents understand. You understand working and slaving and, and getting that special thing for that child that you love. And Adam and Eve spit in his eye and say, we don't believe that you love us. We don't believe. We don't trust you enough to do what you asked us to do. We're going to do our own thing. And he watches a perfect world spin out of control. Within the space of one generation, brothers are killing brothers. Violence is born. He's watching people grow old and die things that he never meant to happen 
you think God doesn't know grief? God's lost more people than you will ever lose. God understands grief. You are not alone. You are not alone. I'm not, we're not in a competition. A lot of things that have been said today, I'm going to echo. I walked into my brother's room. Missed him at Christmas. But God understands grief and sorrow. All throughout the Gospels, it continually talks about Jesus being moved by compassion or having compassion. What was happening? He could not walk among his people without feeling what they felt without seeing the hurt and the pain. And he was not, sometimes as the pictures, you know, he's standing there in his white robes and he's standing so perfectly and he was moved. There's one, it's actually one of my favorite scriptures. He, he went to, the Bible says he went to get away from the crowds. In other words, he needed a vacation. He needed to, to get away from ministry. And it says that he could not be hid. Jesus is in town. Everybody knows about it. And he didn't tell him to go away. He began to minister and to heal and to preach. He understands you're not alone. <laughs> you know, Isaiah 53 says more than that the Messiah would be acquainted with grief and sorrow. It goes on to say that he would bear our grief and our sorrow. Why is Jesus crying? He's shouldering just a little bit of the burden from Mary and Martha. He knows what's coming, but he knows right now they are crushed down and broken. And he's just going to lift just a little bit off of them and help them carry. For just a few minutes, for just a half an hour to an hour, just long enough to get to the tomb, roll away the stone and call Lazarus out. But it matters that much to him. If you go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says this, We do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. You're not alone. Jesus knows exactly how you feel. You don't surprise him. You don't anger him. You don't shock him. He knows exactly where you're at. And he understands. I wish I could look at you and tell you that I understood. But frankly, I can't because I've not been in your situation. I've not lost the people that you've lost. I've not experienced the things that you've experienced. But what I can do this morning is point you to the one who does know. Who does understand. Huh. You think you're alone. You think when you're crying in the middle of the night that those tears go unmarked into your pillow. They do not. You are never alone. He sees and he marks every single one. You think in the middle of your pain, whether it be physical or emotional, you think that you're bearing it all by yourself. But there is somebody there with you who is bearing it with you. You are not alone. You sit in the middle of a crowd. And you feel a crushing loneliness. You are not and have never been alone. How could Jesus understand loneliness? He hung on a cross in the middle of a crowd and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
You think nobody's ever been in darkness as deep as yours. I'm here to tell you, He plumbed the depths of hell. There's no darkness too dark for Him. He's already been there and come back. You are not alone. You think your anger repels Him. He understands your anger. But I can't be mad at God. It's human. It's human. Mary and Martha were angry at Jesus. I can guarantee you they were. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't tell them, hey, knock it off. Things are going to get better. That moment he wept with them. You're not alone. Or I talked about loss. Believe me, he understands your loss intimately. Whether it be a loved one, whether it be your innocence, whether it be financial, whether anything, any loss that you have, Jesus understands. You are not alone. listening to a testimony this week I haven't asked permission so I don't think I'm going to name the lady but she was uh, given a testimony her parents sent her to a Christian school you know, they were protecting her and in her senior year she got together with a group of friends and people begin to drop out. You know, we're going to get together and then one person has something else to do. And she ended up by herself with one young man. And they were having a good time. They were chuckling. They were laughing. And he tried to kiss her. And he told her to stop. And he went on. He tried to kiss her again. And he told her to stop. She told him to stop. And finally she realized, I'm in trouble. And when she got up to leave the room, he attacked her. She got sick. And being an intelligent young lady, she understood what was going on. She had become pregnant had a Christian school in her senior year. I can't tell anybody. Because if I tell anybody that he attacked me, they're just going to say, oh, it's an excuse because you're pregnant. And so she bore it all by herself the rest of her senior year. She walked across the platform. She took her diploma. And she said it was almost like there was a switch. she realized what do I do now I don't have an excuse of high school now I'm facing life what do I do and so she told her mother and her mother began to ask questions and she realized that her mother did not believe her her mother looked at her and says you're you're going to have an abortion whether you want to or not took her to a clinic and as she described sitting in that office said they won't let you look at the sonogram don't want to look at the technicians or the doctor and she focused on a chair and she focused solely on that and her life began to spin out of control A godly young lady began to drink and get involved in things she shouldn't get involved with because of the hurt and the pain and the shame. And she told this, and this is what struck me. She said she came to a point 
where she pointed her finger at God and she said, Where were you? And in that moment, she got a mental image. See, the chair she focused on had been empty, but she got a mental image. And there was Jesus sitting in that chair with tears falling down his face and his hand on her saying, It's going to be okay we're going to make it through this. You think you're alone. I'm telling you, you are not. I want to share one thing with you. It's kind of a heavy subject today. But it needs to be said. But I do want to share one thing with you. Let's go to the book of Psalms. Chapter 30. There's a promise you need to hear. Psalms 30, verse 5. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. <laughs> Jesus may be weeping with you, but he's weeping with an understanding that joy is coming. I wish I could stand here and tell you that your darkness is going away today. I can't. I wish I could tell you it's going away tomorrow. I can't. But what I can tell you is you are not alone. There's a God that loves you. There's a God that wants to help you, to, to strengthen you, to, to help you bear that burden. And I want you to know, even though you can't see light, morning is coming. Morning is coming. It could be today. I hope it is. But it could be when you enter eternity. But no matter what happens, morning is coming. And you're going to know rejoicing again. And the God who weeps with you is going to be the God who rejoices with you. I'm going to have the musicians come. I'm just going to close with a story. I'm from the north. And y'all think you know what snow is. You don't. story is told of a young man that wanted to visit his friend's house. But it's going to storm. And Dad tells him, no. You can't go. But he's insistent. Dad, it's a short distance away. I know the way. I'm not a little boy anymore. I can make it. Dad said, it's dangerous. He said, I, I don't care. He said, I don't need your help anymore. I'm a grown, I'm a grown man. So he starts out the door to his friend's house as the storm flows in. Now, some of you may not be aware of this, but when they talk about a whiteout, that's what they mean. Can't see anything but swirling snow. He begins to walk. And at some point, the thought crosses his mind, boy, I've been walking a lot further than I should have, but I haven't seen my friend's house. But he's too proud to turn around. I told Dad I could do it. So there's only one thing to do. Keep walking. He's walking. He begins to look around. The snow is falling. The cold seeping into his bones. His face is frozen. And he doesn't recognize anything. Well, I know. I can't go back. Dad's going to point his finger at me and laugh at me. And I don't even think I could find the way. And so he keeps walking. And finally, he comes to the point where he just falls down in the snow. And he begins to cry. He's, he's, you know, even though he's a young man, he's not afraid to do that. He begins to cry. It's a bad situation. And he calls out for his father. And in that moment, Dad's right there. And he says, how did you find me? He said, son, I never left you. He said, I followed you out the door. When you missed your friend's house, I made sure I could track you through the snow. He said, when you crossed the road, I flagged the cars down so that they didn't hit you. But you said you wanted to do it alone, so I've been waiting for you. 
to tell me you needed me. I've been right here the whole time. You have never been alone. And he wrapped his boy up and took him home to his house. You are not alone. Jesus is here. I cannot know your situation. I cannot understand everything that you're going through. But I'm telling you, there is a God that does. And He is here this morning with strength and with hope. I can't promise that your situation is going to be answered today. I can't. But I can promise that Jesus will love you through it. If you call Him, He will answer. He'll shoulder the burden with you. You're not alone. This altar is open. You can come and seek Him here. But here's the thing too. You can seek Him right where you're at. I'm not going to tell you you have to come here. You have to go anywhere. You have to do anything. But if you call Him no matter where you're at, He will answer. If you've lost something, where church has come to seek and to save that which is lost. If you've lost something, today can be the day to find it again. Today can be the day to have Jesus come into your life and do a work that you didn't think could ever happen again. Cry out to Him. Call out to Jesus. You see somebody around you praying, you begin to pray for them. If, you're not, if you don't have a list of you to do it yourself, pray for them. Nobody should be alone in the church. No, should, nobody should pray alone in the church. You should gather around them and help. As they sing, I'm telling you, I'm giving you the opportunity. But you have to take the chance. You have to call out. You have to give God the opportunity to work. I don't think it was an accident that he preached what he preached today. It was fit well together as usual. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm glad to know that I have an advocate with the Father. The man, Jesus Christ. He's not just a spirit, although his spirit is everywhere. And no matter where you are, he is there. But I'm glad to know that He has felt everything that I've felt. I'm glad to know that every pain, every sorrow, every fear, He has endured it. And He is not unmoved by the feeling of my infirmity. And He is, no matter how long, no matter how long your night has been, no matter how dark your night has been, He is the hope that cometh in the morning. I am convinced that Tim didn't preach this for nothing. There's somebody that needs to be at this altar right now. Maybe a lot of people need to be at this altar right now. If you can't tell me that there's not needs that be, need to be met. You can't tell me that there's hurts that never go away. That pain that just keeps on coming. That hurt that just never stops. That thing that just won't quit. It just keeps coming and keeps coming. And it never will leave me alone. I have news for you. Scripture tells us that where evil abounds, where grief abounds, where pain abounds, His grace doth much more abound. Hallelujah. Let's worship Him right now. Church, let's find a place to pray. If you need to pray where you are, you, you feel led to come to this altar, it's not a sign of weakness. Oh no. Coming to the altar is a sign of strength. A sign of strength. Hallelujah. But if you want to pray, if you want to kneel where you are, let's just pray. Reach out to that one that's next to you. 
lay your hand on them and speak. You know, in order to, in order to manifest things of God, we need to speak them. Speak peace. Speak strength. Speak support into their lives. Right now, where you are. Lord Jesus, we love you today. We're thankful that you mourn. We're thankful that you weep. Hallelujah, Jesus. There's some pain and there's some needs in this place right now. Oh, hallelujah. We can feel the tears coming in from heaven. Tears from the throne of broken hearts and destroyed lives. Hallelujah. We can feel your mourning. But we know that you also have the power to resurrect us into fullness of life. Hallelujah. He didn't leave Lazarus in the grave. He could have just wept. He could have just wept and said, I'm sorry that I didn't come in time. But he didn't do that. He did not do that. He walked up in front of the grave. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Hallelujah. He didn't leave them hopeless. He did grieve for them. But he also gave him life. Hallelujah. He can give you life. It may seem like the darkness is closed in. It may seem to be no light in your life. <laughs> but Jesus is never late. It may seem like it's been a long time. Like you've had to wait for a long time. But Jesus is never late. Could it be this morning? Could it be today? Is the time that the advocate, the lamb, showed up right on time. And he's weeping for you. Could it be that today is your time? And that He picked out this day just special because you thought that all hope was gone. You thought that there was no way that your pain would ever go away. You thought that there was no help for you. But you came here today and you had a preacher stand before you and deliver a message just for you. Hallelujah. You know Jesus uses people. Hallelujah. We cannot be obtuse to those around us. We need to weep. Jesus set an example for us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus. Church, let's pray. Sing.